Hello, and thank you for joining us for our latest Finnovate webinar featuring Nuxio, one of the fastest growing content services platforms in the market. I'm David Penn, research analyst with the Finnovate Group. Leading our discussion are a pair of industry professionals, Chris McLaughlin, Chief Marketing Officer and Chief Product Officer for Nuxio, and Tim Nelms, Vice President International at Crawford Technologies. Over the course of the next hour, Chris and Tim will discuss how companies are modernizing print management in today's age of privacy and how your company can do the same. Specifically, we'll look at how to replace expensive printing and posting with digital delivery and a mobile-first strategy, how to modernize antiquated and expensive legacy print management solutions, and how to do all of this while remaining compliant with all relevant regulatory requirements, from the GDPR to the California Privacy Act. As a reminder, before we get started, this is an interactive presentation, so we look forward to fielding your questions. Please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll have a little time at the end of the presentation for both Chris and Tim to respond to them. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. Chris, Tim, take it away. Wonderful. David, thank you for the kind introduction, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. As David said, over the next uh, hour, uh, Tim and I are going to uh, walk you through some information on how to unlock your print stream data and really make it accessible to your customers and valuable to your business in driving an improved customer experience. So the title here on the slide, a little bit off in terms of talking about a smarter approach to customer communications archiving, but what we're really talking about here is how we unlock that information, how we enable you to deliver a better experience to your customers. And before we dive into the topic today, I thought it would be valuable for us to just look at a little bit of background from a customer experience perspective, provide a little bit of business context. So what we're seeing with our banking and insurance customers is they are very much shifting to a customer-centric uh, strategy, a strategy that is really built around delivering an exceptional customer experience. And we kind of included two quotes here to get started. I know this is a bit of motherhood and apple pie, but the critical thing for us and what we're going to be talking about today is customer experience as an outcome. And really starting with that outcome and then working our way back from a technology perspective to figure out how to deliver on that outcome. Kind of as we align to that quote uh, here from Steve Jobs about starting with that customer experience and then working your way back to the technology. The other key thing that we recognize, and particularly as our financial services customers are competing more and more with born digital companies, bank tech, insure tech type companies, who really are built around a modern customer experience, we recognize that more and more customer experience really is becoming the key differentiator in this marketplace, overtaking both price and uh, product as, as the key differentiators for brands. So when we talk about the customer experience, we talk about customer intimacy, and we talk about delivering financial services, products, and services in a customer-centric fashion, what we're really talking about here is making it easy and fast for customers to engage with these products and services. We also, of course, want to be presenting products and services to customers that are highly personalized, relevant, they meet their needs. We're not presenting products and services to customers that aren't relevant to their particular needs or circumstances. And of course, we want to make response mechanisms immediately available. So how do we engage with those products and services? How do we begin to consume those products and services? And then the other key challenges that we see for customers really is around consistency. So many of our customers today are really working around multi-channel and omni-channel strategies and delivering these products and services across print, web, uh, mobile devices, and even in their customer service and call center operations. So it's critical for them to have a consistent experience. One of the things that we find is access to information across these diff different channels is a real challenge. So when we talk about customer centricity, and again, We'll get to the hows and whys of this in a moment, but when we talk about customer centricity, we also have to talk about the information that drives customer centricity and how becoming more customer centric is really creating a much greater demand on access to information and how our customers deliver information to their customers. So when we talk about customer communications, we talk about customer information, of course it has to be always on, always available, 24-7, 365 access to that information. We have to be able to deliver across 
any type of device, and we really have to be able to do it in the customer's time frame and with respect to the customer's personal choices. So how do they want to be communicated with, in which channel, across which device? So really thinking about convenience and choice as part of that information delivery mechanism. And then certainly more recently, it's become increasingly important for our customers to be environmentally friendly in the way that they deliver information to their customers. So whether you're a bank or an insurer, really thinking about the environmental impact of your communications. And a lot of our customers are very focused on how do we move uh, traditional print communications to electronic channels. Of course, this has an environmental impact, but it also has a very important price and cost impact for organizations as they avoid printing and postal charges moving forward. So I mentioned this would be a dialogue, and so I would like to introduce Tim Nelms and have Tim talk to you a little bit about key business drivers here. Tim, I've talked a lot about customer experience, but certainly is there anything you want to add here? And then also, do you want to talk about some of the other key business drivers you see? Yeah, so maybe I can add something here about um, insurance and banking in particular. You talked about customer experience, and I think there are a couple of dimensions to that which are relevant here. First of all, there's the quality of experience within the channel. So that is what happens when you're conducting business through, for example, a store or online, so-called multi-channel. But then there's the issue of transferring that knowledge across channels so that, you know, for example, in a store transaction, can you complete that online or vice versa? So we're seeing a lot of interest in financial services and making those experiences absolutely seamless. Another key issue for financial service companies is the degree to which M&A influences systems and processes. For example, you know, if you buy a book of business, that means potentially silos of information in existing systems need to be integrated into new customer experiences. And it's coming back to that same age-old problem of the single view of the customer versus the many siloed views of customers that you get in lots of siloed systems. So that same problem of single view applies to compliance and governance. So if you've got multiple silos of information, it's a real problem because you need to have consistent policies for both information access and things like record and retention. Now, financial services companies often have huge problems with that because governance processes can't work across those multiple dislocated back-end systems. And the final broad factor that I see in banks and insurance companies is a trend towards green initiatives. In fact, you'd be hard pushed to find a large bank or insurer who hadn't had this as one of their board level objectives in the last 10 years. And the two things aren't incompatible because reducing your carbon footprint by providing a digital experience to consumers is an obvious win, both environmentally and fiscally. So Tim, uh, I noticed we didn't add cost reduction to this slide and thought maybe you could give uh, our audience some examples of how by shifting traditional print communications to electronic channels, we can help them also reduce costs while reducing that carbon footprint. Well, it's really a simple factor of mathematics, Chris, because if you look at the cost of the average customer communication, if you're going to print, envelope, and post that communication, you're typically talking anywhere between $0.50 cents and $1.50 to go through that whole process, depending upon the size of the communication. So if you look at current trends in terms of the adoption of digital communications, they range from anywhere uh, from about 22% up to 50% at the moment. So if you look at a typical insurer, for example, maybe with 5 million odd customers, you might say that there's uh, 25 million odd communications over the course of a year to those customers. If you multiply that by the cost of printing and posting, you very quickly get to a very hard cost number. And when you apply you know, factors for digital delivery and you take that out of that number, you can see uh, cost savings in the millions of dollars very quickly. So even for the average insurer, even small insurers, it's a huge benefit to go digital. Fantastic. 
Tim, I, I, we're talking about high volume communications here, and you, you quoted some big numbers. Uh, do you want to talk about the types of documents and communications we're talking about here? Yeah, well, it, it is certainly the size of the problem of managing customer communications that challenges most companies. If you look at it from a volume perspective, the, the number of outbound communications from any retail company dwarfs any other content type you're likely to find. Uh, it'll at least be a factor of 50 bigger than other kinds of content, for example, inbound communications or human-authored content. And if you add to that the challenge that some of the documents are very long, for example, many insurance policy documents can easily run up to 15 pages with statutory text and key facts. So the, the problem is that customer communications are fundamental to these operations because they represent the contract between the consumer and the insurer or the bank. And they're critical to communicating all that information about your, your policy, your renewal, your statement, your claim, you know, letters, marketing information, all those kinds of things to consumers. Now, volume-wise, it is huge because in the US and Europe, there are well over 5 billion insurance documents a year printed and posted by insurers. And that's excluding things that might be delivered online. If you look at banking, that number rises to about 7 billion a year. So when you look at those documents, they're typically produced by you know, big banking and insurance core business applications. Um, in some cases, they might be produced by enterprise applications, the RP systems, for example. And commonly nowadays, you know, there are tools that get in the way like document composition systems that facilitate converting data into really interesting looking documents. And then of course, once they're produced, they're sent to print service providers, to mailing, and for printing, and then on to customers. And it's very easy to see the kind of changes that occurred in the last 20 years. If you think back to you know, a statement you might have had in the early 1990s, they were black and white, they were a bit drab, they had monospaced fonts, they had pre-printed stationery. And nowadays we have all kinds of you know, powerful, personalized, colorful communications. And we tend to expect that as the norm. And add to this the fact that production and distribution of many of these documents is mandated by regulation. Well, that's why high volume transactional customer communications are a big challenge for financial services companies. And Tim, I'm noting the quote here on the right about the, uh, from Ernst & Young and, and uh, the five tech trends that will define the future of insurance that, uh, you know, the trend is towards more frequent, more meaningful, more impactful communications. Can you talk a little bit more about kind of the trends you're seeing in terms of shifting from traditional print communications to online communications and how that's even increasing the challenge for insurers and banks moving forward? Yeah, well, I guess the interesting problem there is the movement away from page-oriented systems for communicating. So communicating on paper, which is bounded by a page, and transferring that information into formats that are scrolled, like you have on a mobile phone or on a web page. So there are some interesting technological challenges there in terms of making the transition from pages back to the scroll, if you like. The, the second factor that I'm seeing there is that these uh, communications have to be accessible. You know, there's an enormous base out there of people who don't have equal abilities. And you need to provide information to people who have print impairments, for example. So those are clearly things that are driving the market at the moment and driving the way that people are adopting new practices for communicating with customers. And you got, uh, you got into our next slide here in terms of talking about uh, accessibility of communications. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what we're seeing from a compliance standpoint and also from an accessibility standpoint and what impact that's having on how our customers communicate with their customers? Yeah, well, I think we're all familiar with some of the big corporate developments in financial services regulations. So Sarbanes, Oxley, but that's all too. But at the consumer end of the spectrum, there's been a raft of regulation aimed at protecting consumer rights. And they range from state and national regulation for insurers. Like, for example, in the UK, we have the so called Insurance Conduct of Business Guidelines, or ICOB. And they have things to say about uh, customer communications that include everything from 
what should be in the documents uh, to how long they have to be retained. Now, if you look at where regulation exists in banking and insurance, for example, companies are expected to retain bank statements typically for seven years. For general insurance policy documents, it's three years. For invoices and tax documents, there's a range, but probably between seven and 11 years is uh, about the, uh, the ready range. And in the case of life policies, of course, the retention period elapses several years after the death of the policyholder. So records retention is a real issue. And then there's personal data protection in the forms of things like the California Consumer Privacy Act and the European Union's own general data protection regulation. So GDPR throws up some very interesting challenges like the right to be forgotten. And that requires organizations to be able to delete information related to an individual. And that can be really tricky if it's held in large batches in corporate systems. And finally, and we touched on this on the last slide, there's an increasing focus on equality legislation. And that aims to ensure that people with, for example, print impairments, people who might be blind or partially sighted, can still access critical information about their banking and insurance products. And that's covered in the U.S. by the Americans with Disability Act. In the U.K., it's covered by the Equality Act of 2010. And we're seeing increasingly uh, increasing vigilance about the ability of companies to deliver equitable services across a whole range of abilities. So regulation is very big around these kinds of communication. So, Tim, I think it's really interesting here. We'll talk a little bit more about kind of the fiscal impact of some of these existing technologies. But one of the key things that uh, we are seeing with our customers, and I want to emphasize this for our audience here, is just that, that need to be able to segment and parse information that historically has been lumped together in a print stream. Uh, we talked about that right to be forgotten there uh, and GDPR. And certainly for our European customers, this has been a really important issue as they've struggled with print stream data and kind of being able to respond to those subject action requests uh, that come in under GDPR. Um, what's interesting to me is Europe's been a bit out in front on this, but now with the California Consumer Privacy Act, which I believe goes into effect in January, we're beginning to see similar legislation in the U.S. around this data privacy as well as data ownership uh, for consumers. Um, the other thing that was really interesting for me is that I learned the other day that there are now, I believe, 14 other states in the United States that are considering similar legislation to the California Consumer Privacy Act. So for our U.S. customers on this call, certainly looking uh, across banking and financial services, this is going to be a, a, a very considerable impact to their business and a big challenge for anyone who maintains customer information in a print stream. So with that, let's talk a little bit about uh, challenges with legacy systems, Tim, and what we're seeing uh, our customers struggle with today. Yeah, well, maybe let's start with a little bit of nomenclature. So the, the term that's used to describe software that captures these kind of electronic versions of customer communications and stores them online is a customer communication archive, a CCA. And the process of allowing customers to have electronic access to those documents is commonly called e-presentment. Now, it's very common to find in the industry that those kind of customer communication archives, those CCAs, were deployed you know, 20 years ago, and actually they're still in place today. And that's not bad. These systems are great. They've given great service for many, many years. But the products tend to be of their time. Now, what I mean by that is that you know, they're often somewhat monolithic. They might have been architected for mainframes, possibly client-server architectures, and they rely on relatively expensive compute and storage infrastructure. Uh, as a result, they tend to be difficult to integrate into mo modern business application environments. They tend to um, be less useful for the kind of scale that we see today in modern web applications. So they're, they're not architected for the modern flexible cloud, hybrid cloud environments we want to deploy on. And nobody would call them cloud native. Nobody would call them cloud friendly. They're just not of that generation. Now, in the last 10 years, there's also been a seismic change in the way that companies communicate through digital channels. And it's no surprise that 
you know, things like the web and mobile devices and email are at the center of that kind of a change. And where once these kinds of systems tended to be accessed by really relatively small numbers of users, you know, perhaps a, a few hundred or thousand people in a call center, nowadays consumers are using self-service tools to access the information directly. And we all do it by mobile phones and by our computers. And the problem is that these legacy systems sometimes struggle to scale at a reasonable price point. That's the key phrase here for that kind of access. So that, that takes us to this fact that these systems are expensive to maintain. All that compute, network, storage infrastructure adds up and is not unusual for large companies to spend easily between two and ten million dollars a year on maintaining such systems. And there's also a, a technical deficit. You know, when your developers are all using web services and application servers and HTMLs and modern technologies, it's difficult to find the skills to run those old sort of batch mainframe systems for customer communications. And, and it's not just the platforms, it's things like the formats and the standards, you know, they use uh, content formats like Metacode, AFP, and line data, all great formats and of their day, but not the kind of things we want to use nowadays for long-term archiving. And as a result, the cost of communication archives in you know, insurance, insurers and banks varies widely. And really, by no means are all companies getting the same financial benefits of moving to digital communications archives that they should because their systems are expensive and costly to run. So, Tim, you talked a little bit about the challenges we see in terms of uh, being able to access this information across mobile devices and, and more modern uh, channels that we engage with customers through. Uh, I also wanted to emphasize the challenge that we see uh, in terms of as customers themselves begin to modernize their core systems and how they engage with their customers, whether that's uh, core insurance systems, core banking systems, CRM systems, or even their customer service call center solutions. Obviously, they also want to make this information accessible to their own employees as they engage with and interact with customers. And so one of the key challenges that we see uh, is where uh, these organizations are beginning to modernize those core systems and then having to go back with these 25-plus-year-old legacy platforms and get them to play nicely and integrate uh, with these new systems. So when we talk about kind of that cloud-friendly, cloud-native piece, yes, there are all the benefits of cloud in terms of cost reduction and in terms of really shifting that, that infrastructural load uh, to a dedicated provider, but we also find that it has implicit uh, requirements in terms of how different technologies interact and what type of APIs they offer in terms of being able to integrate with some of these new standards for core systems, for CRM, and for customer service solutions. So why don't we talk a little bit about what we believe is a much smarter approach for this, Tim, and can you uh, highlight both how we extract this information from print streams, but also how we would make it accessible across the entire organization? Yeah, so, you know, we're starting from a point here where we know that our, our current system is old, is obsolete, is costly, is complex to maintain, and it's for all those reasons, along with probably a desire to be information governance that we want to move to something a little bit more next generation. Uh, so the question is why Nuxio and why CTM Gateway is the right tool for doing that. Actually, I'd like to start with Nuxio because, you know, if you look at Nuxio, it's really a reimagining of the traditional architecture for content. And it's combining, you know, scalable cloud with a clever data storage architecture with web services. And it gives you everything that you'd expect from a content platform, but in that form, including metadata management, full text search content, storage governance, API, all of those kinds of things that you need to build an effective customer communication archive. In fact, you know, the other great thing I think about Nuxio is they've spent a great deal of time to ensure that Nuxio can perform at scale. If you look at the benchmarks for the core platform, it's capable of servicing really high volume, mission critical customer communications archive and each presentment workflows. So you know, working on top of that cloud platform, working on top of things like AWS, means that um, companies can benefit from the economies of, uh, of scale of running in cloud infrastructure and scaling up and down 
according to how the system is being used at one point in time. So a, a crucial part of the process for running this kind of a system is actually loading and retrieving communications uh, from and to Nuxio. So big organizations, they just they need to you know, put a few documents in every day. It's loading millions of documents a day, which means ensuring that ingestion pipeline is as efficient as possible and uh, that you're maintaining a service to customers at the same time. And, and our customers can't, the documents in their systems, in if not the hundreds of millions, in the billions. It's not uncommon for our customers to have 10 billion plus documents that they're keeping. So Nuxio's customer communication archiving architecture uses Crawford Technologies CCM Gateway product to manage three things. It's the transformation, so the conversion from one format to another, indexing, and then loading of documents into Nuxio. And our core, flat, core platform is widely deployed with legacy customer communication archives, and that gives the added reassurance that Nuxio can directly support the same kinds of things you find in those legacy systems that we were talking about. So our core transform modules handle things like print formats, that's uh, AFP, Metacode, Postscript, PCL, PDF, even line data. And those transformations are the products in our engineering team of years and years of continuous development. And that guarantees really high quality, high fidelity conversions between formats. Uh, many of the customers that we work with, with Nuxio, are actually choosing formats like PDF, if not PDFA, the ISO standard for long-term archiving, because it's got significant long-term benefits over those traditional print formats. Now, having said that, for those wanting to store legacy print formats, we've also managed to do that as well in Nuxio. So we provide the ability to store those formats in Nuxio as well. So that's absolutely right. You can continue to store AFP in Nuxio if you want to do that. Now, we do use a couple of interesting approaches with Nuxio, and we call these no-burst and full-burst archiving. Now, what that means is that our customers can trade storage efficiency with granularity of records management. And we take full advantage of this approach, which means that, you know, the content that we store either bears a very close resemblance to that that you stored in your legacy system or is highly granular for this kind of GDPR records management. The final thing that we're adding to the Nuxio platform is the e-presentment component. That's the ability to take things out of an archive and actually render it into different things on demand. Because if you're storing PDF, but you need to present HTML or, or some kind of reflowable content on a mobile device or a browser, you're going to need to make that happen at the time that you uh, retrieve the document. Uh, another thing that we use that for is accessible tagging. That's the process of formatting a document for, for example, screen readers that support blind and partially sighted users. And that, once again, may need to be done in real time based on the user's needs. And there are other you know, things that you can do usefully at that point in time, things like redacting information to comply with PCI DSS in call centers or indeed adding digital signatures to guarantee consumers' authenticity of documents. So behind the scenes, there's a really strong integration of Crawford Technologies with Nuxio to deliver these really high quality, high volume uh, CCM archiving and e-presentment services. Wow, Tim, you uh, delivered a lot of information there on one slide. So if I can summarize just a little bit, I think what you're looking at here is a, a integrated solution that allows us to take this legacy print stream information, uh, convert it into entirely uh, modern and accessible documents for customers, and then deliver it really through any channel, any device, uh, and any application that needs it in the organization. I think the other thing that I would emphasize here from a diagrammatic standpoint, uh, as Tim mentioned very kindly, thank you, Tim, uh, we are a, a true uh, content services platform, not just a uh, customer communications archiving solution, which means that Nuxio not only has the ability to manage 
this converted print stream data, or as Tim said, even the original print stream data in that environment, but also other related customer information, other content and information that is critical to customers. And what we're seeing more and more is organizations looking to begin to consolidate that information. We talked about M&A earlier. We talked about customer experience earlier, but really being able to bring all that information together and present it to customers as well as employees who service those customers. So it's critical to begin tearing down some of those silos. And I can't believe after 20 plus years in this industry, we're still talking about that, but it's still a very real challenge for our customers. Tim also talked about new communication forms, and one of the things that we're seeing alongside of these print stream communications is that more and more our customers are beginning to communicate with their customers, their consumers in real time. So they're leveraging technologies like email, SMS messaging, and things like that. And in many cases, it's very difficult for their employees to get access to the same information that their customers are receiving. So having this common repository that really allows them to manage all the different types of communications they send to their customers, and then being able to serve that to different applications in their organization or in self-service uh, applications to the customers themselves directly is critical for the success of their enterprise and their customer experience. So Tim, with that, I thought we would shift gears a little bit and just give uh, our audience here a couple of examples of where we've been doing this today. And I'll kick off and talk a little bit about uh, this customer. It is a banking customer. Uh, and the term future proof here in the title is their term, not ours. Uh, and I'll give you a little more context on that in a moment. Uh, unfortunately, we're not able to share their name with you, but in this circumstance, they are one of the world's top five financial services brands. Uh, they have about 102 million customers worldwide and over 14,000 branches globally, so you can probably guess who they are. Uh, in this particular circumstance, we are actually working with the UK uh, uh, operation of this bank. And the UK operation has about 15 million customers uh, and about 20,000 employees that we're supporting with this solution. Now, from a challenges standpoint, this was a customer that was working with uh, one of these uh, legacy CCA solutions, in this case, the IBM Content Manager on Demand solution. And about 2.5 billion documents uh, that were spread across different locations and different iterations of their system. And beyond replacing IBM uh, CMOD in this environment, we also consolidated five other uh, content management technologies to support their operation. Again, to get that, that consistent kind of 360-degree customer view. One of the real challenges that we saw here for this organization, and when we talk here about compliance mandates, let's be specific, we're talking about GDPR and the ability to respond to uh, subject action requests. Um, so that was a big driver for them. But the other driver for them was really about being able to utilize this content, this information across a variety of different use cases and new applications in their organization. One of those use cases was around uh, providing a new mobile app to customers for personalized uh, statement delivery. So what they really wanted to do was come up with what they termed a future-proof foundation and lay the foundation for them to be able to build a variety of different applications, both mobile and online applications that could access this information and leverage it across a variety of new use cases inside their organization. Now, they first started down a homegrown path, looked to build this uh, using cloud technologies themselves, and very quickly realized that they could simply get there more quickly uh, working with Nuxio and Crawford. So the other key issue for them organizationally was just as they were beginning to lay this foundation, they are continuing to grow and outpace their competition in this marketplace. And so that growth, as well as additional mergers and acquisitions, was creating further silos and challenges for them organizationally. So what we were able to do for them in a very short period of time, three months, was to migrate their existing uh, customer communication archiving solution to the Nuxio platform, move those 2 billion plus documents across, replace that legacy system, and begin to seamlessly integrate our product 
uh, with their existing customer service systems. We also help them to build a new mobile application for personalized statement delivery in this environment. From a business outcome standpoint, and I think this is the important thing here, what we were really able to do for this organization was take out a tremendous amount of cost associated with their existing legacy system, enable them to comply with GDPR, to be able to quickly and promptly respond to subject access requests from customers. And most importantly for our customer here, really uh, meet their need for future proofing, for laying that foundation so that they could continue to drive digital transformation transformation initiatives in their organization. What they really wanted to do with our technology is adopt a very agile DevOps approach to how they continue to build new applications, new services, and new products for customers laying on top of that information foundation that we established for them. So Tim, how about you talk to us a little bit about Society General? Yeah, well, what I love about this one, Chris, is it speaks to uh, at least two of the things we've been talking about, regulation and volume. So uh, as we have a tendency to do in Europe, we come up with regulations from time to time. One of the ones that uh, came up in 2007 was a requirement for businesses across Europe to store uh, essentially uh, VAT tax documents for a period of at least seven years. And in some jurisdictions around Europe is a little bit longer than that. So that's things like uh, invoices to suppliers and other business partners you might be doing business with. Almost uh, congruent that, with that, though, there was also um, a change in the market, so-called Single European Payment Authority, or SEPA for short, that required payment transactions across European borders to be archived and kept for compliance reasons. So both of those things came together to form this requirement for Societe Generale. Now, I suppose when we began this project, um, I didn't really know quite what the volumes were going to be. As it turned out, we found ourselves archiving over 30 billion records um, as both PDF documents, but also as data records. And I think that's um, a factor in a lot of um, financial service systems is that you're not just storing documents in a sort of paged content fashion, but you need to store data as well, sort of XML records as they would be these days. So the solution that we offered helped them transform uh, AFP content into PDF to index it and then to archive it into the system. And it now contains over 100 billion records between those different documents, the uh, VAT documents, and the data records. So the great thing about this is it's a single platform for holding both structured data and what I call semi-structured data in the case of those VAT documents. And all of that information is available to uh, bank staff and customers, and it puts them in full compliance with those European payment and VAT regulations. So that's the City General. Wonderful. And Tim, how about an example for our insurance customers in the audience? Well, I wouldn't want to leave them out, Chris, that's for sure. Now, th this, I think, speaks really nicely to some of the legacy challenges we were talking about earlier. So, you know, uh, if um, uh, the biggest insurer in the Nordic region across Sweden, uh, Sweden uh, Finland, Norway, and Denmark, and other parts of the Baltic states, so uh, they had, over time, acquired businesses, they had M&A activity, they'd acquired different systems. In fact, they had three different content management systems. So part of their challenge was to migrate and uh, put that information into a single system. And one of the legacy systems from IBM contained over 100 different types of information, over 100 million documents, largely stored in an AFP format. And those documents were variously used in different customer pacing portals for online e-presentment. So there was quite a degree of complexity about the environment, the back-end systems, and the portals. So what we provided was a system to convert that AFP data into industry standard, ISO standard, PDFA, uh, to allow them to extract the metadata that they needed, things like customer number, policy number, the data which the transaction occurred, 
and then to put that into a single core system that it could be used across all of those portals. So it saved money in a number of ways because it allowed them to save money on having three systems and just having one system instead. It also provided better digital and online services and there's significant annual cost savings as a result. So that's a common story I find with people who are making that transition from legacy systems into modern technology. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. So in the interest of time, I think it's a, a good place for us to kind of wrap up and just uh, emphasize some of the, the key benefits. And then uh, happy to open up here, uh, David, for questions. Um, so just uh, to put a fine point on it in terms of benefits and, and what we've been talking about today, uh, clearly very focused on the customer experience and how we deliver information to inform that customer experience and enable that customer centricity. Uh, we've talked about uh, the benefit of a cloud-based platform that is low cost, open API, allows you to easily integrate, connect, and operate at a, uh, a very low cost basis, as well as consolidate customer information, both from these customer communications archiving systems, as well as from other content sources, information sources in your environment. Clearly, we've emphasized the importance of being able to respond to some of the more modern uh, compliance and data privacy requirements uh, in the marketplace today, and the importance really of being able to separate out this customer information, both from an information access standpoint, as well as from a compliance uh, uh, perspective. Um, certainly, and, and something we've hit uh, throughout the different case uh, studies and examples is the ability to eliminate some of the uh, expensive aspects of these legacy systems, move off of older technologies as well as older supporting infrastructure, mainframe, AS400s, onto more modern uh, infrastructure uh, and much lower cost systems. Uh, we didn't emphasize this through the different uh, case studies, but certainly something else we would also uh, really point to is if you look at points four and six, how do we reduce print costs, help you take cost out of your operations? How do we reduce the corresponding carbon footprint uh, by moving to more electronic channels? And in, in point number six, enabling that customer self-service aspect. The more we drive customers and give customers the ability to service themselves, the more we improve the customer experience, and also the more we reduce costs for the organization, both in terms of driving print communications as well as interactions and, and costs association associated with call center operations. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly for our banking and insurance customers, really how are we driving that improved customer experience? And it's all about anytime, anywhere access to critical information and making that access completely device agnostic. We wanna make it seamless, we wanna make it easy for customers to move across different channels and we also wanna make sure that they are getting consistent communications, consistent information across all those different channels and making that information accessible regardless of what the customer's particular needs are. So hopefully we've done a good job of talking to you today about some of the benefits of a new approach to customer communication archiving and really how we would go about unlocking print stream data to improve the overall customer experience. David, with that, I think we will uh, open up for questions. Uh, also provided some information here, both for Tim and myself, if people have questions that they wanna ask uh, offline or through different channels, but would certainly love to take questions now. Great, let's go ahead and do that. And I, first, I just want to thank both uh, uh, Chris and Tim for a very, very interesting presentation on uh, some of the topics that I know many of us in, uh, in this industry, broadly defined, are looking at in terms of digital transformation, in terms of helping uh, institutions do a better job of meeting the growing array of, of regula regulations that are, uh, that are coming out, but obviously here in the United States as well as around the world. So I thought it was very, very interesting to hear you touch on a number of those uh, ways in which technology helps uh, helps, again, these institutions address these. Um, I do want to remind uh, everyone listening that we still have uh, about 50 minutes or so before we finish. We have a few questions that have come in, but there's still plenty of time. If you have a question for Chris or Tim, go ahead and hit that Ask a Question button and submit your question, and uh, we will try to get to as many of them 
um, as we can. We just had a few more come in just a moment ago, so please, if you do have a question, uh, go ahead, don't hesitate, and send that to us. And as I mentioned, we'll get to those as, as quickly as uh, as quickly as possible. So let me go ahead and take a look at some of these uh, questions here. Uh, let me see. Let me just start at this uh, first one that came in. I guess this maybe is a point of clarification, and I'll go ahead and just read it in, in full uh, to make sure I have the individual's question accurately. Uh, the person asks, you said that you make fully accessible documents with uh, PDF, UA, HTML5, and Braille. Uh, can you elaborate on why this is important and whether or not you have to convert the documents to an accessible format first before storing them in Nuxio, or can the documents already stored in Nuxio be made accessible? So an interesting question there. Well, Chris, maybe uh, I'll take that one. Um, so, you know, accessibility and accessible documents is something of a speciality for Crawford Technologies. And indeed, there, there are several approaches to doing that and to giving people access to accessible content. And I suppose you're seeing the same kind of digital transformation happening for people who have those kind of impairments as you do in all other parts of life. You know, you see people using mobile phones to read out messages, uh, to read out documents. And key technologies there are things like HTML. Um, HTML, WCAG, for example, WCAG 2.1, 2.2, specify how you can make your web applications and web content accessible for people. Now, for a, a little while, PDF, um, I guess, struggled a little bit there because it didn't have the same accessibility. So what we've seen in the PDF sphere is the addition to the PDF standard of accessible PDF, or PDF UA, as it's technically known. And what that helps us do is to actually tag content within the PDF in much the same way as you would semantically tag information in HTML. So it allows you to identify, for example, titles, headers, um, different levels of heading, paragraphs, um, text on uh, images, for example. And by doing that, we can then use uh, screen reading technology to read out the information on those documents. And there's something even more powerful about that because the same processes we use to do that kind of tagging can also help you drive other alternate accessible formats like audio, uh, like Braille, so it really uh, increases the options for giving people the kind of format that they want. And a lot of legislation actually requires companies to deliver accessible documents in a format of the choosing of the recipient. So you have to be open and able to deliver all of those formats in the future. Excellent point. That was one of the things I know I had in, in my notes as you were discussing uh, some of the various uh, regulations and compliance with GDPR and, and so forth, and thinking about things, for example, as ADA and the American Disabilities Act and other ways and other sorts of regulations that maybe don't often immediately come to mind, but are very much part of the picture um, and part of the way that this technology can actually help, again, those companies uh, meet those requirements, uh, those regulatory requirements. Um, sort of another question that I think kind of follows uh, nicely along that, and uh, I'll go ahead and read this question uh, verbatim as well. Uh, is there any way to extract the data from statements, invoices, and other documents to make that data available to our analytics and AI tooling? Uh, you talked about the idea of the cost savings, scalability, and it seems like certainly one of the other advantages of, of the digitization would be being able to leverage that again, as the, as the questioner asks, in terms of analytics and AI and that sort of thing. Uh, how, does, uh, how does that fare in terms of the uh, extraction capacities? Well, maybe you want to I'll, that uh, take that. Yeah, I'll take that one as well. Thank you. Well, uh, so the, the, the interesting feature of these kinds of transactional communication that go to customers is actually they may be the last place that that data about the transaction lives. If you look at the core business systems, that data will get purged from time to time. So in essence, that record contains the lasting archive and record of how you're doing business. Now, we've seen some really interesting examples of this, of companies actually going back through these customer communication archives to mine that data to find out how their business was performing 10 or 15 years ago. So certainly that approach to data mining uh, and to then using that in analytical applications is not new. 
And uh, I can see some really great value in doing that and uh, and using this kind of content, this semi-structured information to drive um, uh, not only intuition, but you know, evidence-based approaches to, to looking at how you deliver service to customers over time and how you can improve it in the future. So, yes, I think there are some really interesting possibilities there. Excellent, excellent. I definitely know that is uh, the idea is once you get that data, the idea is what all can you do with it. And, and again, digitization certainly uh, completely opens the door on the possibilities uh, that, can, that can be done, how that data can be leveraged. Again, want to let everyone know we are, we're coming up toward the top of the hour, but there is still time if you have a question for uh, Chris and Tim, please uh, feel free to go ahead and, and send it in. Uh, we've got a few more here in the queue, but uh, we'd be more than happy to try to get yours in as well. So if you do have a question, again, please don't hesitate to send it our way. Uh, here's another very important question. Um, it might have already been addressed in the presentation. I wasn't quite sure, but let's definitely make clear. And uh, the question I asked, does the Nexia Crawford solution run only in the cloud, or can it be deployed on-premises as well? Jim, I think we finally have one I can answer. Um, happy to jump love. in on that one, David. <laughs> um, so uh, while we have focused very much on kind of the cloud nature of these, uh, these two products and, and the benefits of cloud, I uh, certainly want to emphasize that uh, these technologies can also be deployed on premises. Uh, in fact, we've kind of shifted away from, from having a conversation about cloud versus on premises to more a uh, conversation of uh, cloud versus self managed. And what we are finding is even for our customers who want to deploy these technologies themselves, uh, in most cases, those customers are leveraging cloud technologies of their own, uh, maybe working with their own cloud provider or their own cloud technologies in their data centers. Um, so uh, kind of wholesale from an industry standpoint, we're seeing a shift towards cloud, whether or not that, that is something operated by uh, Nuxio and Crawford or whether that is something operated by the customer themselves is really just a business decision they need to be, they need to make. But the critical thing there is you're getting all the benefit and power of cloud native technologies and you can deploy it anywhere you want to, whether that's in your organization, on premises, uh, in your cloud, or uh, certainly in our cloud as well. Excellent, excellent. Uh, again, I, we're coming up on the top of the hour. I just had one question I wanted to squeeze, uh, squeeze in if we could before, uh, if we totally run out of time. And that was just hearing about some of the different organizations and, and, uh, and institutions that have been taking advantage of this technology. I'm curious, uh, who in the financial services space, whether it's insurance companies, banks, do you believe have been sort of uh, uh, leaders in making directions in terms of, of, of making this transition with regard to, to uh, print documents? Is there uh, any industry within the financial services you can highlight as being particularly forward-thinking and forward-acting in this regard, or, or is it all sort of uh, – it really depends on the individual companies? Jim, you want to go first? Yeah, I'll, I'll go first on that one. So I, I would say it is a little bit of a mixed picture at the moment in terms of adoption. Um, you know, the, there are an awful lot of existing systems out there that have been in place for a long, long time. And in fact, um, when it comes to customer communication archiving, I'd say that's one of the last big applications in all probability still resident on the mainframe. So uh, if you have a mainframe, you know, that may be one of the few things you have left running on it. So the strange thing is, is that there are uh, great new ways of doing that. You know, it's not a problem to change those systems. And I think a lot of people have a concern and a reticence that can, you know, new architectures like the cloud really support this kind of scale and volume that I need. So uh, there is something of a... Um, of a build-up in demand for, for companies to make this change. I will say the companies that I see doing best here tend to be banks at the moment. There are some big investments going on in the banking industry to replace some of these legacy systems, some very, very large projects indeed, You know, using exactly the kind of architectures that we've described in this presentation. Um, and I'd say the maybe the insurance market is uh, lagging a little bit behind that, um, but we're certainly seeing demand build up there. Chris. 
Yeah, Tim, I, I would tend to agree with that. I, I think that uh, we see some regional differences too. So um, in Europe, certainly it seems to be the, the banks that are out in front uh, and are moving aggressively uh, down a path that, such as we've described with Crawford and Nuxio. Um, in the U.S., interestingly enough, we have seen some of the more leading-edge uh, property and casualty companies uh, and even some of the more leading-edge uh, health insurers begin to really rethink uh, their customer communication strategies and how they are making this information accessible to their customers. Um, we've had less pressure, I think, in the U.S. from a compliance standpoint, uh, but I think that is rapidly changing. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very, very much. Uh, I want to say that uh, that's about all the time we have for today, I'm afraid. Um, but I do want to thank you all of you who attended for joining us today. And also thanks especially to our speakers, Chris and Tim, for a very fascinating uh, conversation on digital transformation. Uh, a copy of this webinar uh, is going to be available on the Fenevate blog in the days to come. So if there's some information you'd like to double check or double back on, uh, do keep uh, an eye on the Fenevate blog uh, for that availability. So I want to thank you all again for being a part of our Fenevate webinar series. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you next time.